Let us pray, shall we? Gracious God, we thank you that you have given us a Savior, Jesus, who is there to help us. And we do confess that our help is in Jesus alone. It's not that he doesn't use other means to reach us, but our ultimate hope and help is in him. And we are so grateful for that hope and help that he provides. We pray a prayer of thanks for the word that he gives us. And as we gather around his word in a special way today, oh God, I pray that the words of my mouth and all of our thoughts and prayers are pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I wonder sometimes if the disciples used to do what we do when one of our loved ones leaves us, either by dying or by moving away. When that happens, we, their family and friends, we may sit around a campfire or a living room or a dining room table and ask each other, remember when? Remember when they were here? Remember what she used to say? Remember what he used to do? How many of you have done that before? Yeah. I wonder if the disciples... In those early days after Jesus rose from the grave and then 40 days later he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God and then he was gone. And I wonder in those early days of the disciples building the church and carrying out his ministry and mission, if they didn't occasionally stop what they were doing and sit around maybe a campfire and say, remember when? Peter, Peter might have said, to the guys, hey, hey, rem- remember when Jesus told us that story of the father, the father who had two sons, and the younger son took his share of the inheritance and, and went out and squandered it all. But, but when he came home, the father welcomed him back with open arms. Remember when Jesus told us that story? And the other guys would say, yeah, yeah, I remember that. That was a good one. That was a good one. And then James, the son of Zebedee, said, yeah, Peter, remember the, remember the, the time Jesus told us the story about the, the shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one of them went missing. And he left the 99 in the wilderness and searched all night until he found his lost sheep. And, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. That was a good one, too. And then maybe one of the lesser knowns, Thaddeus or, or, or Bartholomew or James, the son of Alphaeus or Simon the Canaanian, We've said, remember, remember when Jesus told that, that, that one story about the, the chief financial officer that went rogue and, and, and cheated the, the employer's customers out of millions of dollars and was caught red-handed and summarily fired, but then had the audacity to go back to the very people that he cheated, work out a backroom deal such that the employer praised him? <laughs> remember that one? That was crazy. And I wonder if the disciples would be like, what? Well, what? <laughs> I don't remember that one. <laughs> Did Jesus say that? How about you? You remember that one? Jesus said that. Or something very similar to that. It's one of the lesser known parables. It's called the parable of the dishonest manager. And it's the theme of our message today. Today is the fifth and And second to last week, the penultimate week of our sermon series called Living by Faith in the Real World. And each week over this past month, we've been looking at a story from Jesus' life and what we can learn from it about how to bring kingdom values into our everyday living. That's been our goal. And our scripture today is this parable, Luke 16, verses 1 through 9, and it goes like this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought against him. 
that the, the manager was, quote, squandering the master's property. So he summoned him and said, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management. You cannot be my manager any longer. The manager thought to himself, what will I do now that my master has taken my position away from me? <laughs> I am not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what I will do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how, how much do you owe my master? A hundred jugs of oil. The manager said, sit down quickly, take your bill, and make it 50. And he said to another, how much do you owe my master? A hundred containers of wheat. The manager said, take your bill and make it 80. And the master commended this dishonest manager, for he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. For I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal home. The word of God for the people of God. So, do you remember that one? couple heads up and down. It's not really on the VBS curriculum, right? It's not what we teach children in Sunday school. It's not on the lectionary, right? We like sheep and shepherds and goats and all of that nice stuff. But I would submit today that there's a lot here that can really speak to us and can help us as we think about bringing kingdom values into our daily living. Let's take a closer look at it. It starts with a master, quote, right? A master. And this master is probably some kind of landowner, maybe a huge estate owner, maybe multiple estates, landowner, a business owner, maybe has multiple businesses. At the very least, he is exceedingly rich, very, very wealthy. And it was not uncommon in this day and age for the very rich like this to hire managers to manage the businesses. Maybe in our own corporate culture, this would be like the owner of the business doesn't handle the day-to-day -day operations. They farm that out to a COO, chief operations officer, some such thing. Right. They're doing the day-to-day -day work. The, the owner is not looking over the shoulder and micromanaging every item that's done right, on a day-to-day -day basis. That was very common, which means that the manager here is given a lot of leeway, right? No one really looking over his shoulder. And it was not uncommon in this day and age for these managers to then take the uh, owner's assets, money, and loan it out to the locals, small business owners, farmers, families, right? to loan it out with a sizable interest attached to it that the manager would pocket. Even though Deuteronomy 23 verse 19 said, quote, you shall not charge interest on a loan to another Israelite, that's what the manager was doing. Take the master's assets, money, loan it out to others, high interest rate, pocket the excess. Now, in all likelihood, a rich landowner like this, business owner, probably would have known that this is going on, tend to look the other way until there's a problem. Well, guess what? There's a problem now. <laughs> because so many complaints have been coming in, very likely from the very people who had been <laughs> exploited through these interest rates. So many complaints have come into the master that he has to do something about it. And the, the specific charge that's coming to the master about the manager is that he is, quote, squandering the property. 
Now, what do we think of when we think of squandering? Wasting, losing, taking unnecessarily riskful chances with. In any case, it's gone, right? The word in Greek there does not just mean to lose. It means to lavish through and through or thoroughly lavish. And so in that sense, we see the manager has taken the master's assets, which do not belong to him, and he's using them to lavish himself (laughs) through what he's exploited from these other people that he's lending the money out to. And that's what has to be addressed by the master. And so the master calls him in, okay, show me an account, show me an accounting of your management as though he's done this before, maybe. And then he summarily fires him. And we can notice two very important parts of the story right here. The manager is fired, correct? The Bible says, you can no longer be my manager. That's pretty clear. You're done. And notice that there's no crack in the door for coming back in, right? He doesn't say, you are temporarily suspended without pay, with or without pay, whatever, you know? And, but if you do A, B, and C, then maybe we'll bring you back in. None of that. If that's the case, then there's not a lot of motivation or incentive for this manager to reconcile with the master. There's nothing, quote, in it for him. He does no, no uh, avenue to get his job back. Furthermore, notice that the manager does not deny it. He doesn't protest in any way. I asked the, the earlier services, how many of you, if you were charged of something and did not do it, would protest? A little bit maybe, at least. Uh, yeah, right? So the fact that he doesn't is some sort of tacit admission that he's guilty. So if the, taking these two pieces of information, right, he's caught red-handed, he's in the wrong, he's no opportunity to get, to get his job back, he is truly incentivized to run away. Why not leave? Go to a new community where they don't know my past. Start over in a new line of work. Right? But notice that this manager doesn't do any of this. He doesn't run away to a new profession. He doesn't run away to a new community. And he actually, he has a moment of clarity. He says to himself, what will I do now that my job is taken from me? What will I do? It's as though he's looking at his life in a new way for the first time. And he's seeing things clearly for the way they really are. Like the story in the prodigal son, that younger son takes his father's inheritance and goes away. And when he lost it all and he's in the pig pen, the Bible says he came to his right mind. He came to himself. He saw things clearly for what they really were, and that led him to come home. That's kind of what's happening here. And he sees quite clearly that he can't run away to a new job because he says, look at me. I'm not strong enough to dig. I can't do manual labor. I'm too too ashamed to beg, so I'm not going to do that. In other words, I don't know what to do. This is what I've been trained to do. I don't know where to go. And notice that he doesn't run away to a new community as though he understands that this is his home and these are his people and he has to make it work here. No, you see, he's not motivated by getting his job back. He's not motivated by running away and starting over. But what he is motivated by is repairing these relationships with the people that he's exploited, his own neighbors, the small business owners, the farmers, the neighbors in his own community that he's been exploiting. You see, for years he's been taking advantage of the system that allows him to operate without a lot of looking over the shoulder. You know what economists like to call that? There's a special phrase that economists use, exploiting market inefficiencies. Get that, in other words, getting away with it. Right? 
And see, it's almost as though this manager has a, he comes to his mind and he realizes that, that every time that a market is, quote, exploited, an inefficient market is exploited, it's the people on the ground that pay the price. Your neighbors pay the price. The farmers pay the price. The small business owners, they're the ones that really suffer at his expense. It's like he's come face to face with his own sin, his own culpability. And he stands up and he, and he, and he reaches out to make amends and restitution. He lines all the people up that he's loaned money to. He summoned his master's debtors one by one, and he, and he reduces each of their debt. How much do you owe? A hundred. Make it fifty. How much do you owe? A hundred. Make it eighty. How much do you owe? Sixty. Make it forty. Right? And on down the line. He slashes their debt. And what is he slashing? The interest that he charged and he pocketed himself. And so in the end, the master gets what belongs to the master. His reputation is intact. The people get what they were taken from, back what what was taken from them. And the one that loses, at least materially, is the manager. But that's only in the short run. Because what he really did, he took advantage of the opportunity that he had opportunity that he had in that present moment to prepare for his future. Because, because he didn't run away, and, he, and rather he stepped forward and met each one of his neighbors face to face that he had exploited, and he, by standing there and making restitution, John the Baptist called that bearing fruits worthy of your repentance, by looking them in the eyes, showing them through his actions that I did you wrong and I'm going to do my best to make it right. What did he gain? He gained their trust. He gained their respect. He owned up to his mistakes, even suffering the consequences in the process. But he gained relationship. He gained a community that because he did that, honestly, was going to welcome him into their community long after he was fired from his job. I believe that's why Jesus praises him and says, and the master commended this guy who had been dishonest because he acted shrewdly. And shrewdly there to me is he did something wise. (laughs) He he took advantage of the situation that he had, the moment that he had when he came face to face with his own culpability and he sought to make it right. And in doing so, he prepared for his future in that community forever. And you see, these parables about Jesus are about forever type things. They're not about just physical things like interest rates and loans and managers. This parable is really about spiritual things. And I believe this nine-verse story is really a nice summary of our whole journey of salvation for all of us. So if we say that God is the master in this story and we are the manager, what do we learn about God? That God is abundantly generous. And God says, here, take what I have. Take care of it. I'll give you my whole creation. I'll give you all of these spiritual gifts. I'll give you all of these blessings. Take it, and I'm going to go away. (laughs) I'm going to give you all this stuff, and I'm going to give you freedom and room to choose and act and make decisions with what you're going to do with what I've given you. Isn't that awesome? That God trusts us that much? Of course, what do we do when God's not looking? We tend to mess it up. Right? That's what it means. That's what, that's what sin is. Sin is either taking what we've been given and holding it to ourselves. That's why Jesus said, by the way, the greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And he didn't say, learn to love yourself as you love your neighbor. Because <laughs> we got to love ourselves down. <laughs> Sometimes we do that. We, we take what God gives us and we hold it to ourselves and keep it to ourselves. Or we use it to lavish even more upon ourselves, not even caring about or not really caring about how other people are hurt in the process. Romans 3.23 says all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. That means you and you and you and me, this guy who stands right here, whoever's, we're all, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. We've all sinned and continue to do so. And there is a moment, as this story teaches us, when we come face to face with our mistakes. Like the manager said, what will I do now? 
that I've come face to face with my wrongdoing. And for all of us, there's a moment like that. Okay, uh, I, I got caught. I, got, I did something wrong. I sinned. I, I, uh, some of my faults and flaws were exposed. What am I going to do now? And each of us has to deal with this. There's pressure and temptation to employ one of the three D's of responsibility when we come face to face with our sin. Here's the first D. Deny. Right? Denial ain't just a river in Egypt, somebody once said. Right? Deny. What we do is we say we run away from the problem. When our sin is exposed to us, we run away from it. We, and and, and if, we, if we run away from it, then we can deny that it really exists because we're not looking at it. Right? That's one way we avoid responsibility, denial. The second D is to deflect. Maybe you've heard this. Not my fault. Right? Bounce off me back there. If that thing didn't happen, I wouldn't have done this. If that person didn't do that, I wouldn't have acted this way. That's blame, like deflecting blame. And then the third thing that we do is to divert. Divert uses languages of, yeah, but. Yeah, I might have done that, but it's not as bad as what that person over there did. So really take your attention away from me and divert it over there. Those are all three ways that we are tempted to deal with our own sin when we come face to face with it. Deny it and run away, deflect it and blame somebody else, or divert attention to something over there. Did the manager do any of that? He did the opposite. He stood up face to face, looked in the mirror, the faces of the people that he had exploited, a reminder of his own sin, he accepted responsibility, and he did what he could in that moment to make it right. And that provided for his future. You see, this story is really, to me, about responsibility. It's about personal responsibility. It's about how, in the real world, we like to demand that others are personally responsible. And truth be told, though, sometimes we try to dodge it ourselves. But this story teaches us that when we accept personal responsibility, not more, than, not more than we're personally responsible for, but as much as we're responsible, responsible for, when we do that, everything improves. Our marriages improve. Our communities improve. Our families are stronger. There was schism and fracture in that community because of that manager's sin. But when he took responsibility, the healing could begin. The healing for the whole community could begin. And more than that, more than that, we prepare for our spiritual and eternal future by taking responsibility. Because think about it, only by accepting responsibility for our sin can we receive the blessings of heaven. If we walk around thinking, not my fault, I didn't do anything, then I'm not in need of God's grace. I don't need it. The only way the grace is real for me is when I admit my culpability, my brokenness, my wrongdoing, when I'm responsible. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we talked about him a few weeks ago, he said, he said many people like uh, to cheapen God's grace and make God's grace cheap. And cheap grace for Bonhoeffer was getting forgiveness without having to say you're sorry. I want all the blessings and none of the work. I want all the good things without any responsibility or accountability. But that's not really grace. That cheapens God's grace into something that it isn't really. Rather, he said, grace is costly. It doesn't come at a cost, meaning it doesn't cost anything to get. Jesus gives it to us freely, but it comes with the cost of responsibility. To receive the grace of God is to, is to treat the, the gifts of God sacredly and, and sensitively and with great awe and reverence and respect. And it's about costly grace is when we mess up and we will mess up. It's about accepting responsibility, stepping forward, owning it, not running away from it, and doing what we can to make restitution for it, which so shows the sincerity of our heart. So personal responsibility really is the way that we take the kingdom values and incorporate them into our, into our everyday living. And it's a way that we prepare for our spiritual future. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, we thank you for this parable of the dishonest manager, and we pray that it, it speaks a word of hope for us, even though it may be a word that challenges us as well. We pray that it speaks a word of hope and courage to us as we continue to strive to, strive to live faithfully in this real world. In your holy name we pray. Amen.